Funding for Curate, the Arizona Arts and Culture Fund is made possible by Signal Society member Eleanor Light and by You Can Become a Curator of the Arts on 8. For more information, call 602-496-8888. And eighth special presentation. This time on Art Beat Nation. Artists take to the streets. This, this is a performance. I'm here for you. Second chances arise through poetry. I'd say the biggest thing that, that people can learn about the folks that are in here that I've learned is that it's not bad people, it's, uh, it's bad decisions. We find inspiration in an unlikely place. I would like to see our audiences see the power of what people working together can do. And learn what makes a great pianist truly great. And this whole world was opened up to me where I learned about all this great music. It's all ahead on this edition of Artbeat Nation. Funding for Artbeat Nation is made possible by donations to Curate, the Arizona PBS Arts and Culture Fund, and by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you. For our first segment, we head to Florida, where chalk artists are taking to the streets. Join us now before their stunning designs get swept away. Well, when I was little, I actually always saw my dad drawing and stuff like that, and so he started doing creating chalk arts, and my senior year in high school, I actually started doing with him. And then about two years after that, I started doing them by myself. You know, what we do basically in chalk art, we're a performance art. Uh, we perform for the people around. And this type of process, you can watch art being produced in the, from your sketch all the way up to finishing a large piece. I was basically working in the studio with acrylic paint for about three years before I stumbled across street painting. And I thought, wow, this is a really cool medium and a really neat way to, um, to do the artwork in front of people. I was already painting in large formats because I painted uh, murals. So I thought, wow, let's give this a try because I'm used to painting really big, so we're gonna do it on the ground now. For me, as an art teacher, it's very difficult to find the time on my own to do some artwork. And so for me, this became a way for me to really kind of exercise my artistic talents and creativities. And um, it really became something more. I just fell in love with the sport. The, one of the common questions people ask when you're talking is, oh my gosh, don't you feel so bad and sad when it gets washed away at the end? Or what happens when it's over? Well, they come and they pressure clean it. Oh my gosh, it's just terrible. And I'm like, no, 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 this, this is a performance. I'm here for you. I'm here to do my artwork and for you to see what I'm doing while it's all happening. That's the excitement of it. And when it's all done, I walk away from it just as if I walked off the stage and not having the space to in your house to actually create something this big. It's great to be able to just go out there and do it and you get to talk to everybody and the kids really enjoy seeing yeah. what you do. They have so many different questions like why do you not have shoes on? Why do you have chalk all over your hands? Why is this chalk different from the chalk we use? And so it's, I love hearing all the questions and answers and the kids' fascination with, oh, I want to create chalk like that when I'm older. For me, there's certain artists that are from the past that I'm really drawn to, and I'm usually drawn to the artists that have a lot of color, um, a lot of intricate designs, and I want to educate people about those artists of the past and, and kind of get them into art and get excited about it just through my artwork. Well, you know, you, you, you tend to look at doing smaller pieces. I mean, you, you, you can see it, you can focus on it. A larger piece, you, you can't get away from it to see it as well, so it's just a challenge. Every concrete is different. Yes. This concrete is fairly new concrete. This con concrete is probably about five or six years old. Very, very new concrete is very difficult to get the chalk to stay down. There have been some areas, I've done it, we've done it on bricks. 
before. So it's always a challenge. Or on the on the roads. Yeah. So you have to deal with like oil stains or the yellow marks in the middle of the roads. You have to take the challenges that Mother Nature or what we do and put them for your art that a normal canvas wouldn't provide. Up next, we meet a young poet working with those who hope to get their lives back on track. By supplying his students with the tools to write, Carlos Contreras is having a real impact. Need some right with? Try one of those doesn't work. So try and give me back the one that doesn't work. Write about whatever you'd like. It doesn't have to be a poem. Whatever's on your heart, whatever's on your mind. Well, this man the other day told me that he could not understand the world that I'm from. And it made me admit that I could never understand his either. I sit in this classroom on Wednesdays in the evening, and there's this dude who's trying to understand the world's border jumpsuits and criminal histories. His heart is like a golden microphone trying to hold a conversation with a broke speaker. It's somehow they communicate. This program uh, that we run out here, we tout it as a, as a self-reflective process. As a, as a journey of looking at oneself and the decisions we make and the choices we make in life and what we're going to do in our future and otherwise what we're doing in the present. Damn. It's modeled partly in that way because that's, that's, that that's simply what I do with writing. It's, it's the way I figure myself out. Uh, I continually discover things about myself on an emotional level <laughs> uh, and writing is the easiest way to do that for me. Now as I look back and remember the past, riddle with painful memories of childhood laughs. Just an act to overcome what was done in an attempt to play dumb, while at the same time trying to suppress the memories of screams that insisted on waking me from my childhood dreams. To be true to the art form, or as true, in my opinion, as true to the art form as possible, you have to realize that, that it's not about you. I write about primarily about myself, and although that, that might sound weird sometimes, I write about understanding myself, and uh, that makes me pretty vulnerable on stage most of the time. But. Every time I said I wish the reaction to time. some of those pieces yeah. have been comfort on, on behalf of audience members that have heard them, and that has made me realize that it's not about me. It's, it's totally about the experience of somebody else hearing what I have to say, not because they need to listen to me, but because hearing what I have to say might help them figure out something about themselves. But life's tricky, so it came fast like a freight train. Once a young boy, now a young man. I was living bad words, no censorship. I had a good life, but it slipped right through my fingertips. I thought life was a game and I played myself with both hands. I'm a dexterous. I know my light's not bright right now, but in time it will shine because it's mine. I would say the biggest thing that, that people can learn about the folks that are in here that I've learned is that it's not bad people. It's, uh, it's bad decisions. I've learned that, that people give up on themselves when you give up on them. And, and our, our program aims to not give up on anybody. Holding people's ability to, to learn is dangerous. Uh, to put people back out on the street without any, any increased intellectual capacity, any increased capacity for being compassionate and caring, uh, any, any capacity that doesn't allow them to be self-reflective. Uh, taking somebody in and turning them back out on the street, either in the same situation they were or in a diminished situation because you gave them no service while they were locked up, that's more dangerous to me. Our participants in, in Just Right come from, not all of them, but a lot of them come from backgrounds of, of drug addicted parents. A lot of them come from split families. A lot of them come from being homeless. It's a lot of solitary time and then they end up in places where you spend even more solitary time. Uh, my point being, they very rarely get to speak to anybody that wants to listen. Start CPR because I don't feel the heartbeat. It's just another addict that fell off his feet. It's not a question of if, it's just how are, how are people gonna change? Are we gonna help them to change themselves for the better? Uh, are we going to help them to continue to make the wrong choices and change for the worse? Because it's funny how things could change for the better. And the good Lord sent me here just like a letter. And just like that, it all went away. Like a dream I had to wake up the next day. I'm free from that life, can't you see? Because once again, God saved me. Twelve years ago when I started doing poetry, I'm, I'm from two older brothers and, and, a, and a dad who was a Marine. And 
And so poetry, being a poet, wasn't like the most attractive thing. Or it was kind of something to make fun of for a real long time, you know, until, until they went to an, a, an event, until my dad heard the first poem I wrote about him. And then they realized that there was something within that art form that, that although they didn't practice it, they could, they could begin to appreciate. They could realize what it took. Engaging with an audience or with a group of people, for me, comes primarily out of being honest. You know, in my writing, it's, it's simply who I am and what I do. And uh, there are no punches pulled and there's, there's genuine honesty delivered. I need to focus on the better days, but the crimes they committed be depending on the weather change. And people steady asking for it, but can they really weather change? I'm just giving my two cents. Because the dude I knew back in the day, they moved bricks underneath the overpass asking for two cents. I care because somebody has to. I care because I met a partner uh, on this project that, that has a heart just as big as mine. Uh, I care because I realize that, that facility, the facility care, I care because we're allowed to care. And, uh, and until they take that ability away from us, then it's our responsibility to do so. There are 3,000 people in this place. If nobody cares about them, then what are we doing for our own community? Do I understand them at all times? No. Do, do, I, do I relate to their background and their experiences all the time? No. Can I care about them even though I don't have that level of understanding? Absolutely. I strive for perfection. It was born into me, branded, expected to be a better version of self with the setting of each sun. Each sun a different rendition of the same song. My melody, discordant though it may be, sings. Because I'd do anything to be able to. But instead, I write. But these instances are never the final draft. Edit in progress. I am a practitioner of process. Poetry bent into the frame of this ink scroll must have something sometimes finding nothing at the end of me. New beginnings offered to each day with the rising of the sun. And I don't mind the sweat, grind, hustle, humble, respectful, respectable. I respect boundaries even when ignoring or breaking them. Aware that they are there, often push beyond the comfortable to find the memorable. Remember me for being the weird kid, loud ones, squeaky wheel, loose screw, dollar shop, but never a minute too late. In fact, sometimes too soon for what's about to come. Coming out of my shell, I figured out these wings need no cocoon. Monarch mounting metaphors, I'm still flying. I write like that's all there is to life, and sometimes it is. But I'm finding space to be comfortable with that I cannot control, which can commonly be deduced to my own thoughts, emotions, and fingertips. Mouth, feet, and lips, I'm a mess. Mass mayhem with ink and a story to tell. Remember me for being confusing, confident, coincidentally always there when you need me, but confused as to what I should be doing. Things are getting done in means and matters of importance. I will remember myself not as important, but better yet, insignificantly different than you because we make better music when making moments with our conversations. Life is a foreign language, and all interactions are simply the translations. I am fork tongue, never forgotten, I hum, sick of the sound of my own voice. If only I could sing. I'd Billy Holiday my way away from here. Coltrane, catch the next one out of town. Onto something not so blue, less gray, all needle and no fix. I'd scratch whatever's beneath the surface and remix. Mix my mouth back into something that made sense. If only. I could sing. For the last 40 years in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, Kohler Company gives artists unprecedented access to share studio space with its industrial workers. Now, over 300 of these artistic creations are on display in a first ever retrospective. Here's a look. We want to give people ways of getting together, of seeing the power of art, the delight of art. It's happened. This exhibit goes back many, many years. And in 1973, we wanted to do an exhibition of contemporary work in clay. And so we went to Kohler Company because Kohler Company was um, celebrating its centennial that year. And we thought, what better way to celebrate the centennial than to use 
one of the major materials that they used. And so we curated it, brought work from all over the country. There were 87 artists in the exhibition with over 300 pieces, and people loved it. But most of all, the artists loved it because they had not been able to see such a large exhibition on contemporary work in clay. More than anything that we could do for artists, we felt was to open up the factory for them to use, for them to gain new knowledge, to experiment, to create whole new bodies of work. It's called Arts Industry, Collaboration and Revelation. And it's all about what was made there, but perhaps equally important, that, that experience that the associates and the artists experienced. And I think you feel that as you go through and you begin to understand what was really happening through those years and how it changed through time, how the work became more and more sophisticated, less about the plumbing and more about a broad range of issues and ideas. One of the pieces that is a must see is a toilet that is actually in the shape of the factory. One of my favorite works by Jack Earl called Saturday Night in Ohio and it is two guys taking a break and playing cards at a table and the table actually the top can come off and it becomes a soup tureen. So it's an industry item that's been turned into art and then in turn has become a different functional object. The work of Jim Neal, it's a piece about war and was inspired by the Chinese warriors that in clay that were dug up. These are not human warriors, they are chimpanzees. And they wear various kinds of armor. And there are 50 of them who face you straight on. And you can't help but be overwhelmed by the power of them. Michael Sherrill is an extraordinary artist. And his work, usually metal and clay, but it's very delicate floral pieces, and they are stunning. Sean Bussey created a work that is quite beautiful. The violins themselves are clay, and it's glazed, a beautiful white, and the cases that surround each violin is of iron. So it's this white against black, and just that makes it very beautiful, very evocative. The first work in the factory that incorporated both clay and iron was the work of an artist named Ron Fondau and used the iron to create a base for the piece. One end rests on the floor and the other end rests on a cone of clay. The color, the yellows, the blues um, against the white, the white and the black are really stunning. Sarah Peters was a very young woman. She had a lot of spunk. The series of wigs that she made were especially beautiful. And today, I, I try to go past them just because I love them so much. I would like to see our audiences see the power of what people working together can do the power of collaboration, the strength of an idea, the persistence that it takes to make it succeed. What amazing things people can do when they work together. To learn more, visit jmkac.org. Pianist Richard Glazier was only nine when he first saw the film Girl Crazy. And that was the moment when his lifelong passion for the American classics was ignited. 
Glazier takes us inside his Sacramento home to share his amazing collection of film history and his love of music. One of the ways that I was really introduced to this wonderful genre of the American song and the American popular musical is my parents, they bought this projector for me and in those days you could go to the public library and with just a library card check out 16 millimeter IB Tech prints of Wizard of Oz, Meet Me in St. Louis, An American in Paris, all the classics for free for two days. I went to the public library and I checked out every book, every record I could about the Gershwins and just started reading all about them and learning so many things about the era. So I have these wonderful memories of sitting in our basement, threading the projector, sitting next to my mom, and this whole world was opened up to me where I learned about all this great music, records that I still have in this house in my collection today. And your home is filled with these beautiful posters. Look at this one, it's huge. This is called a three sheet of Andy Hardy meets Debbie Tyler. The reason it's called a three sheet because there's one sheet here, one sheet here, and one sheet here, and they're, they're glued together. With, of course, your beloved Judy Garland. Right. You know, I fell in love with the voice of Judy Garland. Uh, I saw Girl Crazy before I saw The Wizard of Oz. And I thought that she was just so beautiful in that movie. She looks so beautiful and her singing is so tender and lyrical and romantic and just so special. Richard, your house, every wall is, wow, is covered with musical moments. Isn't a home supposed to be surrounded with things that you love? And that's well, this what is. my wife and I have tried to do in, in our home. I don't claim that I am the Gershwin interpreter. I play very different than the way Gershwin played. But I think it's wonderful because wouldn't the life be boring if everybody played the same way? I'm just interpreting the music. I'm a conduit between the composer and the audience. As a performer, the music and the respect of the music and the respect of the composer always comes first. When I'm performing, there has to be an element of detachment involved in the performance. Otherwise, if you become totally absorbed, then you lose track of communicating with your audience. There's a part of you that has to be in that front row listening. I would like to think, and I have played for people who knew Ira and were closely associated with him, and would say, Ira would have loved that. Um, I wish Ira was alive to hear you play that. It's my passion, it's my life. I mean, it's, there's nothing that makes me happier than being able to communicate this love to other people. And that's, that's a very special thing because, because the love in art, now, again, no matter what it is, whether you're a teacher, whatever it is, you want to achieve a focused energy. That the energy is like a laser beam going out to each individual that's listening to you. Your music is something, you know, we can't touch it, we can't feel it, we can't smell it, but it touches our soul and it makes us uh, something, feel something very special on the inside that elevates us uh, to something that is magical, indeed magical. To hear more, visit richardglazier.com. For more arts and culture, visit azpbs.org artbeat, where you'll find feature videos and information on the Arizona art scene. Funding for Artbeat Nation is made possible by donations to Curate, the Arizona PBS Arts and Culture Fund, and by contributions to eight from viewers like you. Thank you.
Funding for Curate, the Arizona Arts and Culture Fund is made possible by Signal Society member Eleanor Light and by You Can Become a Curator of the Arts on 8. For more information, call 602-496-8888.